Chapter 3 Pursuing Damage Tolerant Composite Structures The Phase 2 ITDs aggressively push the technological state of the art. Thus, although innovative airframe concepts like the HWB offered characteristics that might dramatically reduce fuel consumption, they also presented significant design challenges. For example, constructing a non circular pressure vessel capable of meeting the necessary reduced structural weight requirements required a novel approach. Researchers at NASA and Boeing teamed up to advance a new structural concept called pultruded rod stitched efficient unitized structure, Perseus, for stitching together large sections of damage tolerant, lightweight composite materials that could be used to build uniquely shaped future aircraft weighing as much as 20% less than similarly sized all metal airframes. During ERA Phase 2, researchers assessed structural test articles assembled from integrally stiffened Perseus panels designed to maintain residual load-carrying capabilities under a variety of damage scenarios. One NASA-led research and development of advanced composite structures began during the 1970s in response to rising fuel costs and perceived requirements for more energy-efficient commercial transports. Launched at La RC in 1976, the Aircraft Energy Efficiency, ACEE, program sought to dramatically reduce airline fuel consumption through improved aerodynamic efficiency and lighter structures as well as development of improved engines. Composites research became a centerpiece of the AC program, with the primary goal of accelerating the application of composite primary structures in future civil air transport aircraft designs. Although this goal was never achieved by the time AC ended in 1985, contracts with Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and Lockheed provided the aircraft industry with important new technology. Without the impetus of a NASA technology program, industry players lacked confidence to proceed with such a high-risk investment as using composites, for primary structural components. There was not yet sufficient evidence that composite structures could be produced more economically than aluminum assemblies, or that conventional laminated composites could withstand the rigors of routine flight operations with minimal damage. Two new manufacturing techniques were necessary to overcome these hurdles, and so researchers turned to methods similar to those used by the textiles industry. Advanced composite assemblies would need to be made using woven, knitted, braided, or stitched bundles of carbon filaments, called toes, to make dry preforms. These would then be subjected to resin transfer molding, or resin film infusion, RFI, to produce a composite with through the thickness reinforcement. As with conventional composites, the epoxy resin was cured using heat and pressure inside an autoclave. The process could be facilitated by using sheets of material that have been pre-impregnated, pre-preg, with epoxy resin that could be stored in bulk in a cool area until use. Additionally, in order to reduce labor-intensive operations, production methods would need to be automated to the greatest extent practical. After examining several potential methods for manufacturing preforms, NASA researchers settled on a method involving stitching. Compared to other processes, such as weaves, knits, and braids, stitching offered the greatest potential for cost-effective manufacturing of damage-tolerant structures. In fact, Several military programs already employed stitched carbon-slash-epoxy pre-preg with Kevlar thread to enhance the structural integrity and damage tolerance of thin composite panels. Unfortunately, in the mid-1980s, these methods were of limited use for stitching the thick pre-pregs that would be required for use in large wing structures. Three NASA researchers at La RC explored the potential of several textile processes for use in cost-effective production of damage-tolerant structures. Despite known deficiencies in shear stiffness, resistance to deformation in response to lateral strain, biaxial woven and knitted fabrics were considered simply because they were readily available from commercial sources. A triaxial weave would have been better, but at the time, such a thing was not commercially available. In fact, the textile industry did not see a sufficient market for woven carbon fab borics to make production a worthwhile investment. Instead, researchers began looking at a process to manufacture triaxial warp knit fabric. This technique combined warp knitting with stitching for through the thickness reinforcement to create useful preforms. Testing at La RC provided data for identifying knitted preforms with the best combination of strength and damage tolerance. McDonnell Douglas later used these data in selecting a warp knit fabric that could be used in the fabrication of a composite wing structure. NASA researchers also looked at braiding carbon toes to create a multaxial preform that would be useful for producing damage tolerant composite laminates. They discovered, however, that the same reinforcement feature of the braids that contributed to low damage tolerance also reduced the laminates in plane strength. Moreover, existing commercial braiding machines could not economically pro duce large area preforms. Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman conducted in-house research demonstrating the usefulness of braided composites for smaller structures including window belts, curved fuselage frames, and wing stiffeners, 
where flexibility and damage tolerance are essential. Similarly, McDonnell Douglas adopted braided preforms for blade section stiffeners on wing covers. For the greatest promise, however, lay in stitching. Advanced composite technology in 1987. NASA issued an NRA seeking proposals for innovative approaches to cost-effective composite fabrication, enhanced damage tolerance, and improved analysis methods. The response from industry and academia included 48 proposals, of which 15 were accepted for contract awards. The following year, these contracts became the basis for the Advanced Composite Technology, ACT, program, which focused on developing composite primary structure for fuselage and wing assemblies, and provided impetus for a rapid transition of this technology to industry. ACT program managers specified a goal of reducing the structural weight of a future commercial transport aircraft by 30-50% to 50% while also reducing manufacturing costs by as much as 25%. The resulting primary wing and fuselage structures had to behave, structurally, in a predictable manner, meet FAA requirements for certification, including with regard to damage tolerance, and be repairable in a manner acceptable to the airlines. Another important objective of the ACT program was development of an integrated, affordable composites technology database to foster a rapid and timely transition of this technology into production airframes. Administrative management for the ACT program was assigned to the Structures Technology Program Office at La RC, and each company that received a contract had its own focus. Boeing concentrated on low-cost, automated fabrication techniques. Several other contractors investigated new RTM materials and processes. Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and McDonnell Douglas worked on design and fabrication of composite aircraft structures. Five McDonnell Douglas had been investigating a revolutionary process that involved stitched dry carbon fabric preforms and reinforced composite laminates. Best of all, the resulting assemblies demonstrated outstanding damage tolerance, acceptable fatigue performance, and good strength properties. The company employed an integrated approach that balanced compromises between design and manufacturing in order to simplify fabrication tools, lessen thermal distortion, improve accuracy during assembly, and prevent separation due to out-of-plane loads. Six to showcase the process, McDonnell Douglas demonstrated a building block approach to assembling a wing stub box with a 12-foot span and 8-foot cord. The stub box featured stitched upper and lower covers including skin, blade stiffeners, spar caps and intercostals, the supporting structures between load-bearing members, as integral structures. Technicians at the McDonnell Douglas plant in Long Beach, California, fabricated large tension and compression panels, which later underwent testing at La RC. Evaluation of various epoxy resins led to the conclusion that a formula called Hercules 3501-6 had the best properties and cost advantages. Fabrication of the stub box successfully demonstrated a full-scale stitch-slash-RFI process for assembling an integral wing cover incorporating heavy spar caps, intercostals, and stiffeners with runouts. The build team also took advantage of lessons learned during process development. Replacing uni-weave fabric, for example, with multaxial warp knit fabric preforms eliminated many handling and layup problems. Seven In July 1995, the fully assembled wing stub box arrived at La RC, where it was bolted to a massive steel backstop in the materials laboratory for a series of static loading tests. These included tests building up to the design limit load, DLL, the maximum load factor authorized during operational service. Researchers also gauged the results against the calculated design ultimate load, DUL, the point at which catastrophic failure was expected to occur. Objectives included demonstrating that stitched panels could meet stringent FAA damage and repair criteria, and particularly that damaged composite panels could be restored to design ultimate strength. Prior to the DLL test, technicians purposely inflicted visible damage at a critical location. To promote realism, all repairs were made by aircraft maintenance technicians from American Airlines using mechanically fastened plates. This work was completed before subjecting the test article to the dual test, during which the stub box failed at a load equivalent to 143% DLL. Notably, Failure occurred close to the test fixture mounting point, a metal assembly located some distance from the repair site. Eight by this time, work was already underway to design, build, and test a 42 foot semi span composite wing. Researchers from both NASA and McDonnell Douglas considered this a necessary step in the building block approach to fabricating and testing a full span stitched composite wing and center box assembly of the type that could be used on a 220 seat, single all aircraft. In terms of size and complexity, the semi-span wing test article represented a major step forward. Whereas the stub box was a simple structure with flat cover panels, the wing would require aerodynamically contoured covers, as well as simulated control surfaces, 
engine pylon attachment, and landing gear fairings. Meeting the challenge of these requirements called for advanced tooling concepts and new computer modeling techniques. 9 Boeing assumed responsibility for these efforts following the company's merger with McDonnell Douglas in August 1997. One objective of the semi span wing development was to demonstrate technology readiness through processing, scale up, and structural testing. Researchers used the results to develop and verify techniques to be used in the design, manufacture, and testing of a follow on full scale aircraft wing. First, Designers established specifications for a representative composite wing box structure as part of efforts to develop detailed design features along with the associated analytic cal and manufacturing techniques. This wing box was derived from an aircraft concept representative of a next-generation twin-engine, 220-passenger commercial aircraft equipped with a supercritical airfoil wing with an aspect ratio of 12 to 1 that was optimized using composite material properties.10 for test purposes. The semi-span box represented only the first 42 feet of the wing starting from the aircraft side of body splice outward toward the wingtip. It consisted of an upper and lower stitch slash RFI cover, two spars, and 18 ribs spaced approximately 30 inches apart. Composite stringers were spaced 7.6 inches apart, compared to 6.5-inch spacing for stringers used on typical aluminum wing panels. Taking advantage of the stitching technology, many components were integrated into the cover panels. This reduced the assembly part count and eliminated thousands of fasteners and their associated costs and weight penalties. Each cover panel consisted of multiple stacks of uniaxial warp knit carbon fiber material stitched together to form the wing skin. Additional structural details stitched into the skin panel included blade stiffeners to give added structural stability and interleaved spar caps and intercostal clips for attaching various substructural components. This substructure consisted of ribs and bulkheads made of conventional tape layup carbon composite prepreg and spar webs of stitch slash RFI multiaxial warp knit mate real. Stiffening elements were fabricated by bonding pre-cured stiffeners to pre-cured flat webs. To complete the box assembly, mechanical fasteners were used to attach the cover panels to the substructure. Once completed, the dry preform assembly was placed into rigid tooling and infused with resin in an autoclave. 11 Boeing shipped the completed McDonnell Douglas Legacy Wing Box to La RC, where engineers mounted it to a laboratory wall for testing. Researchers introduced loads using hydraulic jacks to simulate representative aircraft design requirements. Although the semi span test article did not fully represent an optimized wing box design, it included many important design features that emerged as potential solutions to issues that needed addressing in the design of a stitch slash RFI composite wing box for commercial aircraft applications. 12 Following these tests, Boeing continued efforts to develop cost effective composite manufacturing processes in support of the NASA airframe. Materials and Structures Element of the Advanced Subsonic Technology AST, program. Earlier ECT research results showed great promise for reducing both manufacturing cost and damage tolerance barriers to the application of stitch-slash-RFI materials in primary structures for commercial transports. Replacing thousands of mechanical fasteners with a highly automated stitching process had the potential to significantly reduce manufacturing costs of composite structures while simultaneously reducing stress-induced damage and airframe weight. Such advances in composite structure fabrication represented a significant advantage over metallic designs. Toughened resin systems used during ACT efforts in the 1980s showed promise for improving the damage tolerance of carbon fiber composites, but high costs offset the benefits. Development of through the thickness stitching of dry preforms provided a more affordable alternative. 13 goals of the AST program included making composite wing structures 25% lighter than current aluminum wing designs, reducing fabrication costs by 20%, and reducing airline operating costs by approximately 4%. Preliminary design studies by Boeing under La RC contract NAS 120546 showed that these goals were achievable. Using a wing torque box design, applicable to an MD-9040X commercial passenger transport, the company conducted a weight trade study that verified the weight savings a stitch-slash-RFI structure would offer compared to an identical wing box design built from aluminum alloys. Under the AST composite wing program, Boeing planned to build and test a full-scale, Full span, wing box slash fuselage section to demonstrate the maturity of stitch slash RFI technology, but due to program scope reductions, the full scale structural test article was never built. 14 Among the most significant results of the ACT program were development of automated stitching equipment for fabricating an integral wing skin and stiffener concept and improved understanding of the structural mechanics of stitched composites, damage containment, and failure effects. NASA awarded Boeing a contract to develop a high speed, Multi-Needle Advanced Stitching Machine, ASM, 
capable of stitching entire wing covers for large commercial transport aircraft. The Ingersoll Milling Machine Company of Rockford, Illinois, was selected to design and build the ASM under subcontract to Boeing. Pate Technologies Inc. of Irvington, New Jersey, designed and built the ASM's advanced stitching heads. In a cost-sharing effort, NASA spent $10 million on development of the ASM and Boeing paid for renovations at the company's Marvin B. Dow Stitched Composite Center in Huntington Beach, California, which underwent extensive modification to accommodate the ASM.15 equipped with four stitching heads, the ASM combined high speed with advanced automation, allowing manufacturers to assemble large complex wing structures without manual intervention. The ASM was capable of stitching single-piece aircraft wing cover panels 40 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 1.5 inches thick, at a rate of 3,200 stitches per minute. The stitching heads were capable of making 8 stitches per inch with precision row spacing of just 0.2 inches. Achieving this rate required development of an automated thread gripper and cutting mechanism and a pivoting needle mechanism, as well as a cooling system to prevent excessive needle temperature buildup and bending. Prior to stitching a wing panel, a laser projection system precisely located the dry fabric wing skin preforms and any secondary materials, such as stiffeners. Computer controls directed and confirmed the stitching pattern and allowed for 38 axes of motion. Automated controls then synchronized the movements of the stitching heads with each of 50 lift tables necessary to control stitching over the contoured shapes of the airfoil. Researchers demonstrated that the ASM was. Researchers installed a total of 466 strain gauges on the edge of critical access holes at the midplane, but not on the cover panel surface. Additional gauges were placed on the skin and stringer blade surfaces. Resulting data indicated that local nonlinear deformations occurred in the upper cover panel in an unsupported region behind the rear spar. High strain levels were also detected at access holes on the lower cover panel. One surprise was that larger local displacements and strains occurred during the test than had been predicted by nonlinear finite element model, FEM, analysis. Post-test analyzes suggested that further refinements to the FEM might provide a better agreement between analytical results and test data. Otherwise, experimental and analytical results 16. IBID, 19-20. 17. IBID, 20. Were in generally good agreement. This further validated the importance of a building block approach to developing and understanding the behavior and failure modes of composite structures. 18 After successfully completing the first six tests, researchers inflicted discrete source damage on the upper and lower cover panels of the wing by making 7-inch long saw cuts to both the upper and lower cover panels. Each cut ran through two stinger bays and cut through a stringer. The airfoil was then loaded to 70% DLL in a 2.5 grams up bending condition and unloaded, relaxed. Once the airfoil was relaxed, technicians repaired the damaged area to restore the wing to full load carrying capability. Repairs consisted of a metal plate that conformed to the wing contours on the outer surface of the cover panels, and internally spliced stringers. All parts of the repair assembly were attached to the wing using conventional mechanical fasteners. Researchers then inflicted six impacts on the test article. First, a 25-pound, 1.0-inch diameter falling weight was dropped three times from a height of 4 feet, resulting in barely visible damage to the upper cover panel. The depth of the resulting damage ranged from 0.01 to 0.05 inches. Next, an air-propelled steel projectile was used to inflict three impacts to the lower cover panel with an energy level of 83 to 84 foot-pounds. The 0.5-inch diameter steel sphere was accelerated to a speed of approximately 545 feet per second, resulting in clearly visible damage with indent depths up to 0.135 inches. The wing was then loaded to failure in a 2.5 grams up bending load condition. Ultimately, the test article withstood 97% of the duel prior to failing through a lower cover access hole, which resulted in the loss of the entire lower cover panel. 19 These results were quite good and the research team came away with many valuable lessons. Among these was that the building block approach based on tests and analyses of materials and components that make up the structure imparted significant risk reduction, as well as providing important data and analyzes to support the FAA certification process. Researchers noted that composite structures tended to fail in quasi-brittle mode, and that out-of-plane loads, often ignored when manufacturing metal structures, must be considered. Applying loads to areas with perforations such as fastener holes and access openings, stiffener runout, and sites of discrete damage, even when barely visible, have potential for delamination and failure. The ACT program identified issues in design, analyzes, fabrication, and testing of built-up structure that formed the basis for identifying important thrusts for composite, 
fabrication techniques and provided insight into the potential payoff of new technology development. 20 Perhaps surprisingly, many years passed following completion of the ACT program before the first stitched composite production part flew on an airplane. In 2003, Boeing added a composite fairing to the aft fuselage of its C-17 Globemaster III cargo transport, but it experienced only light loading, and did little to demonstrate the structural advantages of stitching. It was, however, an important step in establishing the manufacturing benefits of stitch-slash-RFI technology. It was not until 2007 that more innovative one-piece multi-rib stiffened box structures were produced in the form of new landing gear doors for the C-17. The complex preforms were stitched together, infused with resin, and cured at atmospheric pressures in an oven. To suppress out-of-plane delaminations that were common to the bonded production doors they replaced, all the rib caps and perimeter lands on the new door assemblies were reinforced with through-the-thickness stitching. This allowed operation of the doors further into the post-buckled regime than was possible with the earlier bonded design. 21 Perseus following the end of the ACT program, Boeing continued to work with stitched composites in conjunction with the Air Force Research Laboratory, AFRL, in Dayton, Ohio. The most promising result was a highly integrated stitched concept in which an arrangement of dry, warp-knit fabric preforms, pultruded rods, and foam core materials are assembled and then stitched together to create an optimal structural geometry for fuselage loading. 22 The Perseus concept eventually became a major component of ERA Phase II research. Invented in the 1950s by W. Brandt Goldsworthy, a plastics engineer at Douglas often credited as the father of composites, pultrusion, for pull and extrusion, is a process whereby dry, continuous fibers are pulled through a resin bath and then through a heated dye that cures the resin to set the fiber bundle into its final shape. Goldsworthy's invention of the pultrusion process in the 1950s, historian Stephen Trimble has written, would make durable and high-strength composites affordable for a range of applications, from cars to aircraft parts to fishing rods. 23 For their part, Boeing researchers discovered that adding pultruded rods to the top of each stiffener in a stitched composite assembly allowed the components to be stronger in bending and more structurally efficient, enabling use of lighter weight structures than would normally be required. 24 This was of great interest to NASA because it would help achieve ERA project goals with regard to reducing overall aircraft structural weight. Early testing began with small samples, called coupons in materials testing parlance, that were developed to a point where researchers were confident about moving on to larger-scale test articles. By the time NASA got involved with Perseus, Boeing and AFRL had significantly advanced the art of composite fabrication. Previously, resin-infused materials had to be cured using hard metal tooling and the high pressures and temperatures that could be achieved only with an autoclave. According to Don C. Jegley, a senior aerospace engineer in the La RC Structural Mechanics and Concepts branch, Boeing devised a method that eliminated the need for an autoclave altogether. Composite layups could be cured with just an oven and vacuum pressure. That was really helpful as we began making larger and larger parts, she said, because we no longer needed to worry about whether we had an autoclave available and we were no longer limited based on the size of the autoclave. It also helped reduce some of the uncertainties inherent in the process. When ready for use, pre-preg sheets were removed from the freezer and thawed. At that point, there was only a limited amount of time, usually no more than 30 days, before the layup had to go into the autoclave before the epoxy resin set up. If something goes wrong during that phase where you're laying up all the pieces, you risk having, the process, go past that 30 days, Jiggly said. If your autoclave breaks down when you're partway through laying up the part, then you're going to have parts backing up on the production line and your pre-preg is going to go bad before you have a chance to cure it. 25 Another advantage of Perseus was the elimination of conventional fasteners, rivets, screws, bolts, etc. and a reduction in the number of parts needed for each assembly. Instead of using fasteners, Jiggly said, you just stitch the whole thing together and then you don't have to drill holes, you don't have to keep track of all those fasteners. In traditional metal aircraft assemblies, drilled holes and fastener stress can cause imperfections that later result in cracking or other damage. All drill holes have to be inspected repeatedly throughout the airplane service life, a time-consuming and costly process. A reduction in the required number of metal fasteners promotes structural integrity while reducing inspection costs and, not incidentally, aircraft weight. It does, however, have an impact on disassembly and access to internal spaces. It becomes much more difficult to disassemble the parts, Jiggly noted. That's where there is a trade-off and why you wouldn't want to stitch the whole airplane together because you do need to be able to get inside, for maintenance, but at the same time it allows you to build some very large assemblies using a smaller total number of parts. 26 A stitched composite wing assembly, 
for example could be fabricated from root to tip using single-piece cover panels with integral stiffeners. Similarly, a fuselage or HWB center body could be constructed from just behind the cockpit to just forward of the tail in one piece with all stiffeners in both directions built in. Instead of being assembled in cylindrical barrel sections, the lower half could be fabricated first and packed with all of the necessary hydraulics, electrical systems, and other equipment, and then the floor stitched in place while the top is still open. Eventually, the upper half would be installed. Systems designers see this as an advantage because not only does this eliminate all the joints from one barrel to the next, but it also eliminates the need for joints between the different hydraulic components and electrical components from one barrel section to the next. So you have integrated all of it, and you have easy access, to equipment spaces, before you put the floor in, Jegley said. It also allows for larger single-piece subassemblies. That way, when you get to final assembly, you're now bringing together very few pieces. When you put them all together, you still have real joints and metal fittings and fasteners, but you're bringing together a much smaller number of parts. 27 Perseus technology also made it possible to get away from pre-preg by instead using dry warp knit fabric stitched together with Kevlar or Vectrin, and then curing it later in an oven. The greatest advantage of using dry fabric materials was being able to store them almost indefinitely at room temperature. Then, according to Jegley, you can just push everything off to the side and wait to put it into the oven. This technique came in handy while making some of the parts for a large test article. Because of timing, we were making up panels and then stacking them off to the side in the lab at Boeing while we waited for the oven to become available so we could do all the curing, said Jegley. With pre-preg, you could never do that. The new method, helped us get some of the panels laid up and ready to go and move forward with the schedule without being affected by a short period of time when we didn't have the oven available to us. 28 ERA researchers recognized Perseus technology as a key enabler for manufacturing future HWB airframes. It was clear that requirements for ensuring pressure integrity of a passenger cabin with a non-circular cross-section would result in significant weight penalties if the aircraft were assembled using conventional methods. In fact, this would have been equally true using what were, then state-of-the-art methods for fabricating composite materials. Certain regions of the pressure vessel are subject to out-of-plane loading conditions, in which traditional layered material composite techniques would require thousands of mechanical attachments to suppress delaminations and to join structural elements, ultimately leading to fastener pull-through problems in the thin-gauge skins. Such fasteners and attachments would necessarily contribute to airframe weight. Another argument against conventional composite fabrication involved high manufacturing costs associated with a highly contoured airframe. Building the HWB using traditional means would require complex outer mold line, OML, tooling as well as individual tool sets for all of the interior stringers and frame members, which would further drive up costs. Perseus technology provided the means to fabricate complex aircraft structures that were both effective in out-of-plane loading scenarios and afford able to produce.29 Not only is the flattened geometry of the HWB subject to secondary bending stresses during pressurization, but the shell also experiences a unique biaxial load pattern during maneuver loading conditions. Researchers discover that these load magnitudes are more nearly equal in each in-plane direction than is typically found in conventional tube and wing fuselage arrangements where the cantilevered fuselage is more highly loaded in the NX, streamwise, or fuselage bending, direction, along the stringers, than in the NY, spanwise, or wing bending, direction, along the frames. This characteristic dictates a structural concept in which the optimum surface panel geometry must provide continuous load paths in both directions in addition to efficiently transmitting internal pressure loads, and Z. Additionally, a conventional panel built up in a skin stringer frame arrangement would typically include discontinuous frame shear clip members to allow stringers to pass through uninterrupted in the primary longitudinal loading direction.30 such an arrangement in an HWB would be less effective in bending and axial loading than a continuous frame design attached directly to the skin. In contrast, the Perseus approach replaces conventional laminated and bonded assembly techniques with a single piece, Co-cured panel design with seamless transitions and damage arresting interfaces.31 The highly integrated nature of the Perseus stiffened panel design promotes unprecedented potential for structural optimization through fiber tailoring and load path continuity between individual structural elements. The Perseus structural concept was made possible through advances in fabric manufacturing, out of autoclave resin infusion processing, through thickness stitching technology, and single-sided stitching.32 in Perseus panel geometry. Load path continuity at the stringer frame intersection is maintained in both directions by passing the rod through a small keyhole aperture in the frame web. 
The presence of the rod increases the local strength and stability of the stringer section while simultaneously enhancing the panel's overall bending capability. Frame elements, placed directly on the inner mold line skin surface, are designed to take advantage of carbon fiber tailoring by placing bending and shear conducive layups where they will be most effective. The stitching is used to suppress out of plane failure modes, enabling a higher degree of tailoring than would be possible using conventional laminated materials. This configuration results in a bidirectionally stiffened panel that is highly efficient in all three loading directions. Although this design is ideal for the HWB pressure cabin, it is also applicable to cylindrical fuselage sections with thin skins as well as composite wing structures. The stitching approach would allow thin fuselage skins to safely buckle while causing minimal disruption of transverse stiffener elements, allowing the stringer to pass through a frame or wing rib cap.33 A crucial milestone, fabricating and proof testing a multi-bay box the key to maturing stitched composite manufacturing technology for possible use in constructing a future HWB aircraft involved a building block approach to development and validation of the Perseus concept. Over a roughly four-year period, from late 2009 through 2013, researchers took their work from TRL-3 to TRL-5, demonstrating construction of tension and compression panels, a pressure panel and pressure cube, and then a multi-bay box, the latter demonstrating over a 10% benefit in weight reduction relative to sandwich composites. The first step in designing an effective pressure vessel was to evaluate the effective pressure on a test article called the Internal Pressure Box, IPV. This TRL4 activity demonstrated the capability of a minimum gauge Perseus panel to carry limit loads of 1p, equal to a normal operating pressure of 9.2 pounds per square inch, and 2p, which represents the 18.4 pounds per square inch maximum overpressure Condi tie-in. Next, the team built a single pressurized cube as a risk reduction test, article to examine a new integral cap joint concept. Finally, lessons learned from these tests led to fabrication of a large-scale test article representing a section of an HWB fuselage that could be tested under combined axial and pressure loading.34 is tested on the IPB, the 108 by 48 inch Perseus panel had 20 inch frame spacing, 6 inch stringer spacing, and a 0.052 inch skin thickness. Prior to testing, Engineers conducted both linear and nonlinear static analyzes using a model with a combination of shell and beam finite elements. The test panel was then bolted to a metallic pressure vessel and subjected to pressure loads while a combination of instruments and sensors monitored displacements and strains. Results showed that the pristine pressure panel was capable of withstanding the required 2p internal overpressure loading condition with no evidence of damage. Researchers then inflicted barely visible impact damage, BVID, to a primary load carrying member the rod region of a stringer, and ran the tests again. Even with slight damage, the panel withstood the 2p load condition as well as higher pressures up to 28.44 pounds per square inch before suffering initial failure through the center stiffener. Technicians arrested the damage before it could reach the skin by stitching the stiffener, and the panel was then loaded to 30 pounds per square inch without sustaining additional damage or loss of pressure integrity. Because initial failure occurred at a load significantly higher than that required for commercial transport aircraft, Researchers concluded that pressure loading is not a critical load condition for a minimum gauge Perseus panel. Therefore, the minimum gauge panel geometry of the pressure panel was also applied to the panels used for constructing the pressure cube test article.35 The IPB consisted of six composite Perseus panels assembled using aluminum fittings and an untested stitched integral cap joint concept. The cube assembly was designed to represent a portion of a pressurized HWB fuselage section incorporating the upper cover skin, crown, panel, two side ribs, two side bulkheads, and a pressurized floor section. Because the crown panel was representative of the upper surface of the baseline aircraft, there were few fasteners protruding through the OML, where they would be exposed to the airstream. Two pairs of opposing panels, arranged symmetrically to represent rib and bulkhead panel regions, formed the sides of the pressure cube. These were representative of the outer cabin pressure carrying ribs and the rear pressure bulkhead of the baseline aircraft.36. In order to accommodate an access door and instrumentation pass-through, the floor panel was not strictly representative of the baseline aircraft, but was designed using available panel tooling. Where necessary, components were secured using aluminum fittings and titanium bolts. Stitched T-shaped integral caps were manufactured into the panels to reduce the complexity and number of metallic fittings required to assemble the panels. This integral cap joint design, incorporated around all four edges of the crown panel to provide a means of attaching the side panels, was the main focus of the pressure cube risk reduction test. The pressure cube was also the first test specimen in which Perseus panels were joined together to create a 90-degree corner. 
researchers needed to verify that the joint concept could hold an adjusted 2P load case scaled up to account for the subscale dimensions of the cube. Prior to shipping the cube assembly to La RC, technicians applied a coat of flat white paint to the interior surfaces and the crown panel OML, and gray paint with a spec lead pattern to the rib and bulkhead panel exterior surfaces to help engineers visualize the path of panel delamination and cracks during pressure testing.37 Once again, researchers began by making a detailed FEM to obtain linear analysis predictions and nonlinear analysis verification. They created detailed local FEMs for joint analysis, and, when necessary, employed additional analysis to predict the response of specific local regions of the cube. This detailed analysis was required to predict failure loads and to verify the analytical methods that would later be used for design and analysis of the large-scale test article. The research team completed linear analysis prior to pressure testing in order to determine panel strains and displacements for correlation during the test, to predict critical panel locations and failure modes, and to demonstrate that the overall specimen strength would meet the 2P load requirements.38 as with the earlier pressure panel test. The design pressure limits for the cube were 1p, with a 2p maximum overpressure condition. After testing began, the cube was subjected to several pressure loads at various levels while still in pristine condition, and was later pressure loaded to failure with but imparted to the exterior of the cube at one of the rib integral cap web locations. Initially, researchers conducted two checkout tests at 4.6 pounds per square inch, 0.5p, to verify proper operation of all data acquisition systems and the pressure control system. The pristine cube was cycled up to 1p pressure and then completely unpressurized. Additionally, the pristine cube was cycled up to 20.15 pounds per square inch, 2.2p, prior to being unpressurized to ensure that no failure would occur for the overpressure condition, but with an additional margin of 10% included for safety. Following these pressure cycles, inspectors examined the cube using ultrasonic non-destructive inspect tie-in, NDI, techniques. Researchers then turned the cube on its side and, using a 1-inch spherical drop weight with an impact energy of 100 foot-pounds, imparted bid to an integral cap where it attached a rib and bulkhead. After inspectors performed additional NDI in the vicinity of the bid, the cube was rotated back to the test position and then pressurized until catastrophic failure occurred. Afterward, they performed a final NDI on what remained of the cube.39 upon completion of the pressure cube tests, Researchers determined that the combined pre-test and post-test analytical methods used correlated well with actual test results. Assessment of strain gauge, video image correlation, and NDI data demonstrated that key failure modes and locations had been accurately predicted. In order to effectively serve as a risk reduction specky man, loads in the joints of the pressure cube had to be accurately scalable to demonstrate the higher loads expected in the large-scale test article when subjected to the 2P overpressure condition. Researchers Therefore, conducted additional post-test correlation to relate the bending moments of the pressure cube to those of the planned multi-bay box, MBB, large-scale test article. This comparison yielded a factor of 2.35 difference in the bending moments due to geometric considerations. This meant that to scale up to the required bending moment, the pressure cube needed to meet a loading condition of 4.7p, or approximately 43 pounds per square inch. This demonstrated that a pressure cube failure at 48 pounds per square inch, 5.2p, correlated to an MBB test article failure at 20 pounds per square inch, 2.2p, which met the overpressure requirement.40 The final step in the Perseus Technology Building Block Series involved extensive testing of an 80% scale MBB representing a portion of the center section of an HWB transport aircraft capable of withstanding bending and internal pressure loadings representative of operational conditions. NASA partnered with Boeing to evaluate the MBB test article using the LA-RC Combined Loads Test System, COLTS, facility. Boeing fabricated the test article primarily using Perseus cover panels, pressure bulkheads, and floor structures assembled into a double-deck test article measuring approximately 30 feet wide, 14 feet high, and 7 feet deep.41. The MBB test article was assembled at the Boeing C-17 manufacturing plant in Long Beach. It was sized to represent an 80% scale section of the most heavily loaded portion of the HWB center body. This made the MBB large enough to be representative of a full-scale structure while still allowing the largest composite panels to fit inside the available oven for curing, and also permitting the assembled structure to fit within the Colts test chamber. The MBB structural arrangement consisted of 11 Perseus panels forming the exterior shell and floor members, along with four interior ribs. Boeing first fabricated the crown panel, which was the first 30-foot-long Perseus panel ever made. As such, 
there was necessarily somewhat of a learning curve to the manufacturing process. Increasing the scale of the panel resulted in imperfections caused by motion of metal plates used to transmit normal pressure and temperature, and provided a smooth surface for the finished laminate during the layup process. During resin infusion and curing, these plates shifted in such a way as to create dents in the OML surface. Because the panel skin was only 0.052 inches thick in some places, manufacturers were concerned that these dents might harm the load-carrying capability of the crown panel in compression. It became necessary to add bonded patches over the dents to ensure that the crown panel would not fail prematurely. 42 after the MBB arrived at La RC, researchers subjected it to a series of loadings in the Colts facility. As with the IPB experiments, testing was first conducted with the structure in pristine condition, then with intentional minor damage, and then finally pressurized to failure. Data were monitored and recorded using several types of instrumentation including 262 linear and 36 rosette strain gauges, 15 linear variable displacement transducers, 4 pressure transducers, 4 fiber optic wires, 4 video digital image correlation systems, 26 acoustic emission sensors, and 9 video cameras used to record the behavior of the test article in the Colts system. Researchers initially installed strain gauges on all panels and on most load introduction elements. They added more strain gauges following application of bid to track the progression of damage emanating from the impact site. Video cameras inside each of the MBB6 bays recorded cracks and deformations of the bulkheads, crown, and keel. Researchers monitored additional video cameras outside the test article to obtain a global view of the structure. 43 Once the MBB had been installed inside the Colts, researchers applied mechanical loads to simulate critical flight conditions and internal pressure loads to represent normal cabin pressure. Four actuators provided mechanical loads while internal pressure was introduced through a valve in an upper bulkhead panel access door. Holes in the floor ensured that the pressure remained constant in both the upper and lower sections of the test article. The test series included runs during which mechanical loads were applied alone, pressure was applied alone, and combinations of internal pressure and mechanical loads were applied simultaneously. In each case, loading was quasi-static and was applied slowly enough to ensure that mechanical actuators were synchronized with one another and with the pressure load.44 once again, Researchers conducted DLL and dual loadings of the pristine structure before running the same test with intentional damage. In all cases where the load factor was less than or equal to dual and pressure loading was applied simultaneously with the mechanical load, the pressure and actuator systems were programmed to ramp together from zero to maximum loading. When the programmed mechanical loading exceeded predicted dual, the pressurization system was programmed to not exceed the dual condition for pressure. During each test run, Researchers ramped loads from zero to maximum with short pauses at intervals to compare test data with predictions. Once the maximum load value was attained, it was held briefly to allow for data collect tie-in and then the structure was unloaded at a steady but relatively rapid rate.45 for the next series of test runs, the Colts proved to be a valuable tool for ERA researchers in evaluating the MBB's damage tolerance characteristics. Several experiments were devised to examine the Perseus structure's ability to withstand the types of minor damage that might be incurred during routine flight line operations. Some of the things that could impact the plane are rocks or debris on the runway when it's taking off or landing, said NASA research aerospace engineer Andrew Lovejoy, or you can have a mechanic hit it with a tool, or a vehicle driving by could hit it. 46 Any of those events, extremely common occurrences at airports, could cause damage that might be barely visible only to crew members doing a walk-around inspection. One of the goals of designing damage-arresting composites was so that an aircraft would be capable of sustaining operational loads even with that damage in place. Once again, it was necessary to conduct impact tests to intentionally cause bid, but with such a large test article inside the Colts facility this proved especially challenging.47 To solve this problem, NASA technicians designed and built a unique test rig. If you are going to impact the top of something, you would just have a free-falling weight that would come down and hit, said Lovejoy. You have a mass and a height, so that's a fairly straightforward calculation of the energy. If you wanted to hit on the side, you have a spring-loaded impactor. But researchers needed to strike upward at the keel, or underside, of the MBB. There is very limited space in Colts, Lovejoy explained. You can have an air-driven projectile, or a spring-loaded one, but those are less controllable, so we came up with a roller coaster impactor. In order to produce a controlled impact, it was necessary to propel a weight down a track that curved upward until the impactor was oriented in a vertical direction. We didn't have any device to do that, he added, so we built from scratch an impactor and a track to make it go where we wanted it to go. Two pieces of track encapsulated it just before impact to guarantee that we're getting that vertical impact on the bottom of the keel. 
48 damage testing consisted of three impacts to the interior of the structure on the stiffened side of the upper bulkhead, and three impacts to the exterior of the structure on the unstiffened side of center keel. Researchers used a spring-loaded impactor at locations at the top of a stringer along the upper edge of a frame, and at a mid-bay location between stiffeners to inflict bid to the MBB interior. These impacts represented a range of locations and the type of damage possible due to service events such as tool drops. Exterior damage was inflicted using the gravity-fed roller coaster apparatus to strike locations at the flange edge of a stringer, at the flange edge of a frame, and at a mid-bay skin location between stiffeners. These strikes were imparted to an area of the structure that would likely buckle during loading so as to evaluate whether typical exterior impacts would degrade the performance of buckled structure. In each case, Researchers employed a weight with a 1 inch diameter hemispherical top. 49 researchers noted that bid results for the interior sites corresponded to 20 foot pounds for the top of the stiffeners, which caused little damage but is the maximum energy allowed for internal impacts to commercial aircraft, and 15 foot pounds for the skin mid bay location, where visible damage was clearly evident. Bid for the exterior sites corresponded to energy levels of 60 foot pounds, 50 foot pounds, and 15 foot pounds for the frame flange, stringer flange, and the mid-bay locations, respectively. On one of the exterior tests, the top slightly missed the planned impact site, striking the thin skin region instead of directly at the adjacent flange. As a result, the damage was more severe than intended. The top created a through hole that was clearly visible from both the exterior and interior. Engineers evaluated the damage at this location and indicated that it would not reduce the ability of the structure to sustain mechanical load but might reduce the structure's ability to support internal pressure loads. Technicians effected repairs by taping a non-structural patch over the hole on the inner, stiff inside of the center keel. Inspectors conducted ultrasonic scans immediately before and after each impact so the extent of the damage could be quantified. These scans indicated that although delamination occurred at the keel skin and flange impact sites, it was successfully arrested at the stitch line closest to the impact site. Scans of the bulkhead stiffener impacts found no damage, but inspection of the interior skin impact revealed delamination running from the point of impact to the nearest stitch line, located at the edge of the adjacent flange. 50 Colts engineers repeated the DLL and dual loadings with the final bid test to a load greater than dual in both the up bending and up bending plus pressure conditions. Loads were applied using the same methodology as in the earlier tests, but the pressure was held constant while the mechanical load was increased by 10%. Next, the mechanical load was decreased to dual and held constant while the pressure load was decreased to zero, leaving the test article at dual in the up-bending condition without pressure. Finally, the mechanical load was increased to 10% greater than dual and held briefly before being removed. 51 researchers calculated that the ultimate load factor was 1.5 times the DLL. With testing and data acquisition complete, they concluded that the Perseus large-scale test article had performed beautifully under conditions of multiple and extreme stresses. In fact, said Lovejoy, the MBB exceeded expectations, performing well beyond the predicted duel. From these results, researchers concluded that Perseus technology offered an opportunity to lighten the HWB structure even more, potentially making future aircraft even more efficient. 52 Perseus results testing of Perseus technology during the ERA project was the culmination of more than two decades of effort to develop technology that would improve damage tolerance and reduce the weight of composite structures for commercial transport aircraft applications through the use of through the thickness stitching. The partnership between NASA and Boeing under the ERA project further advanced this technology in an attempt to encourage and enable next-generation aircraft configurations such as the HWB. Analytical modeling and engineering experiments conclusively demonstrated that Perseus technology effectively suppressed delamination, arrested damage, and reduced or eliminated the need for fasteners in the acreage of composite panels. A traditional layered assembly would require thousands of mechanical fasteners to join structural elements and suppress delamination. Disadvantages of using metal bolts and rivets to join layers of thin gauge composite skins include added weight, localized stress fractures, and fastener pull through, a critical failure mode. Reducing the number of fasteners eliminates the need to drill large numbers of holes, reduces the necessity to add doubler plates to mitigate stress concentrations around those holes, and minimizes the time required to inspect fastener holes throughout the service life of the aircraft. 53 The Perseus panel architecture constituted a significant step beyond current state of the art conventional layered composite systems. The addition of a pultruded rod to the stringer, and a tall foam filled frame perpendicular to the stringer, improved bending stiffness in both directions compared to traditional construction, a characteristic critical to the HWB configuration. 
Prisius also provided efficient load paths because all panel elements are integrated into a single one prior to curing, eliminating the need for shear clips and other elements that add weight to the structure. The pultruded rod increased local strength and stability of the stringer section while shifting the neutral axis away from the skin to further enhance overall panel buckling char characteristics. Frame elements were stitched directly onto the skin surface to take advantage of carbon fiber tailoring by placing bending and shear conducive layups where they are most effective. The integral panel design exploited the orthotropic nature of carbon fibers and suppressed out-of-plane failure modes with through-the-thickness stitching. These two features enable applying Perseus technology as an effective damage-arresting design approach for composite structures. 54 Another advantage expected of the Perseus lightweight composite concept is a dramatic overall reduction in airframe weight. This feature was particularly significant when designing the HWB pressure cabin, where the design was largely driven by out-of-plane loading considerations. In addition to secondary bending stresses experienced during pressurization, another key difference between the highly contoured HWB shell and the traditional cylindrical fuse log A is a unique biaxial loading pattern that occurs during maneuver loading. Conditions Load magnitudes for the HWB are nearly equal in each in-plane direction, NX and NY, in contrast to the type of loading typically found in conventional tube and wing fuselage configurations, where the cantilevered fuselage is more highly loaded in the NX direction, along the stringer, then in the NY direction, along the frame. This dictates that the optimum structural panel geometry for the HWB should have continuous load paths in both directions, NX and NY, in addition to efficiently transmitting internal pressure loads, NZ. 55 For a conventional panel built up in a skin stringer frame arrangement, the frame shear clip is typically discontinuous to allow the stringer to pass through the frame. If such an arrangement were used to assemble the HWB center body, the frame would be less effective in bending and axial loading than a continuous frame attached directly to the skin. Additionally, the resulting panel assembly would necessarily be heavier to provide structural strength. To overcome the inherent weight penalties of the non-circular pressure cabin, aircraft manufacturers could instead use Perseus technology to design a lightweight bidirectionally stiffened panel, where the wing bending loads are carried by the frame members and the fuselage bending loads are carried by the stringers. Such a panel arrangement could be optimized to include continuous load paths in both directions, highly tailored stringer and frame laminates, thin skins designed to operate well into the post-buckled regime, and crack-arresting features designed to minimize damage propagation. 56 research results indicate that the Perseus concept would be approximately 10.3% lighter than a conventional aluminum honeycomb sandwich assembly in the pressure cabin of a large BWB aircraft. 57 beginning with tests of small sample coupons and ending with a 30-foot long large-scale pressure box, the Perseus ITD successfully demonstrated the viability of both the technology itself and the use of Perseus construction techniques to build the center body for a proposed HWB transport aircraft. This building block approach showed that designs could be refined and the risk of premature failure reduced as more complex assemblies were introduced. The final test series involving the MBB validated flight maneuver load conditions and internal pressurization loads to demonstrate that the technology was capable of meeting the structural weight goals established for the HWB airframe. The test article demonstrated anticipated post-buckling behavior, and preliminary evaluation showed no damage growth from impact sites. While this ITD was primarily aimed at demonstrating Perseus viability for the HWB, the benefits demonstrated could also be applied to traditional tube and wing aircraft, other advanced configurations, spacecraft, and any struck tours where weight and through the thickness strength are significant design considerations. 58 From a production standpoint, Perseus is also attractive because no autoclave is required, and therefore larger composite parts can be fabricated. Perseus is broadly applicable to fuselages and wings of any shape. It is lightweight, damage tolerant, and built with fewer parts, said Faye Collier, adding it could be a game changer. 59. NASA Armstrong Slash Air Force Research Laboratory tests of OCT flaps installed on a NASA Gulfstream Aerospace G3 validated that the seamless design with its advanced lightweight materials could reduce wing structural weight, improve fuel economy and efficiency, thereby reducing environmental impacts. NASA